Scattered across America are countless towns in disrepair, many of which were once thriving centers of industry. I believe it was in November that I got a call saying that they were going to be closing our factory. Why were these towns left to decay? And who's to blame? The death of the United States shoemaking industry is a story similar to every other industry that's left the country in this new age of the global economy. After international trade barriers were lifted in the late 1900s, corporations flooded around the world to take advantage of cheap labor. However, this came at a dangerous cost. Is it possible that we could bring this type of industry back? I didn't know ultimately if it was possible, but I was willing to put everything I had into it, at least to prove that it wasn't possible. No, we're not gonna do this, and we can't do this, and... Are you crazy? Why are you shutting down this factory? Oh, it's impossible to manufacture here. People need jobs, and they need a purpose in life. The knowledge has only been removed for 20 years. The knowledge is here, the people are here. It just needs a re-injection of some energy. That kind of manufacturing was literally on its way to oblivion. Yes. I knew the challenge in front of me, and I knew it was insane, and I knew it couldn't be done, but I wanted to prove that we could do something right. different. This is the story about the death of America's shoemaking communities, and the group of people working tirelessly to bring it back. This is Wilson Lake, a 560-acre body of water located in Wilton, Maine, at the base of the state's western mountains. Located 100 meters from the lake's outlet is a large wooden building, once home to the G.H. Bass Company, a shoemaking powerhouse for over 100 years. But why was this massive shoe factory positioned in a tiny, middle-of-nowhere town in Maine? Now, with 99% of all shoes sold in America in 2023 being made overseas, what happened to these factories and the communities of people who once worked in them? This is Admiral Richard E. Byrd, pioneering American aviator, polar explorer, and naval officer on an expedition to the South Pole. The boots he's wearing? Made right here in Wilton, Maine. This is Charles Lindbergh before the first ever solo flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The boots he's wearing, also made right here in Wilton, Maine. And this is Michael Jackson in the opening scene of the Thriller music video. The loafers he's wearing, you get the point. But who were the folks that were actually making these shoes? Meet Carlene Wilbur, a former plant manager at G&H Bass. This is unfortunately quite Carlene centered and I got this the day I left. Has all kinds of pictures and photos. I'm a ventriloquist, that's my friend Timothy. I started at Bass on the worst job in the place, Timothy. And that job was putting a chemical on sole so that they would stick to the upper and become, you know, your shoe that you could wear. So I'm there, I bring him out and I start to use him. Six little preschools all started crying. And it was a nasty job, it was a dirty job, your arms broke out and whatever. Hello, kids! But I love my job because of the people that I worked with. I'm gonna sing a song, hold on. At one time, Bass had five different shoe factories going. Hey, Timothy. You could walk out of one today and you could say, forget it, and you could walk in and with one hour you had a job. <laughs> You're gone. It was everything to people to just keep working. They didn't want to go and just slack off there. So it was a really close community, and you'll find that throughout the state of Maine. Maine's hardworking blue-collar workforce provided ample amounts of labor for the factories, but the real reason that factory work dominated New England was much more interesting. <laughs> Zoom out from Wilton and you'll find that legendary brands like Nike, Converse, Puma, and Reebok all used to manufacture shoes here. The geography of why uh, so many industries, boots, textiles, all of that uh, began in the American Northeast is related to the fact that there are lots of rivers and it can turn that water wheel faster which can make the belt run faster that, that powers all the machines. Oddly, if you drive through New England, you don't see these bustling factories anymore. So what were these towns even like back in the day? I got out of college in 1978, purchased this store that was more of a meat market, but it was 100 yards from the Bashu company. This was probably the most sustainable business you could have, but Bass was a big part of the 
regular traffic. Where'd you get that? Oh, I know, Palin's Market. It was a booming area. I mean, we had the Bass executives living here, and they'd stop for coffee in a newspaper. If you had the jobs there, you'd have the people there, you'd have the tax bases. We felt very secure in our financial future. When you're working on some of the best products in the entire world, you can't help but have a little bit of pride in that. There's a lot of pride because we have the talented people here. And I made pretty good money once I got the job. It was good money. I mean, I used to cash checks for these people, $180 to $350. That's a lot of money in, in 19, what was it, 85? So once you were on piecework, it was, how hard do you want to work? We taught them how to work. So on the front, it said, Paling's Market, world famous sandwiches, because we were feeling kind of cocky one day. People from Bass, a lot of them, especially the ladies, they'd walk down, they'd get their salads, they'd get their sandwiches. That was the prime part of my business, which we lost them all by now. So, here's the owner of the store now, the owner of the building. Actually, Rick, I think, worked for Bass's. I think he was a computer guy up there. What did you do at Bass's? Huh? What did you do at Bass? What did I do at Bass? I worked in the warehouse. Warehouse? Yep. Yeah. I thought we'd stick around, but... It's big business. It's one of those that it just works. You know, it goes away eventually. You hope not, but. <laughs> the fact of the matter was, things weren't really going that well. At its peak in 1966, the footwear industry in the United States employed over 240,000 workers, making hundreds of millions of pairs of shoes a year. However, a report by the United States government found that by just 1978, employment in New England states had dropped by about 53% since their height. Threatened by the sudden dip in business, G.H. Bass sent out a letter pointing to the threat of foreign countries buying up American cattle hides, doubling them in price. It warned that as long as our politicians continue to allow cheap exports on leather, their employees would continue to lose their jobs as foreign competition increased, Bass decided to consolidate and ship some of their production overseas. When you open up competition internationally, especially in manufacturing, you pose a tremendous threat to the current working class in your country. When you're chasing money and you're chasing margins and you have a hide that can be made for boots in the United States for $10, but you can go to Mexico for $5, ship it over here for a couple bucks, that saves you $3, and now all of a sudden you're like, well, $3 times 10,000, that's a lot of money. It was only for one reason, for the bottom dollar. I went to China, they make $7 a week. And we couldn't provide more because the country wouldn't let you do it. I didn't like seeing my shoes go there. To give you an idea of just how big it is, this is where the actual manufacturing used to be. This is just a small part of what we have. I believe it was in November that I got a call from the president of Phillips Van Heusen saying that they were going to be closing our factory. Still tough today. And he assured me that they were gonna give us a package deal that nobody would compete with for our people, for all the service we gave to that company. It just says convenience store owner Gary Paling of Wilton, Maine is hoping that he can survive the loss of 350 jobs caused by the closing of a GH Bass shoe manufacturing plant in the town of Wilton. We're at the end of an exodus of companies, said Bass spokesman Gus Wheel. This is always a painful thing to have to do. I'm sure he got a big pay raise. And then we walked out where we had all our people gather so that we can make the announcement. They grew up and were a part of this for many, many years, many retiring here from being young when they came in. I gotta stop. And I had said to my people, I don't want anybody walking out alone. And we didn't let them walk out alone. That's family. The closing of the last Bass Factory marked the ending of a large exodus to overseas manufacturing. 
By that time, other large companies that used to manufacture shoes in New England like Nike had already fully moved their operations overseas. The company was wrought with controversy in the 90s and early 2000s, bookmarked with a short film by Jim Keaty titled Nike Sweatshops Behind the Swoosh. We met with one worker, Giulianto, and he was trying to form an independent union. He was threatened at gunpoint. These human injustices were highlighted again in 2013 when a massive factory in Bangladesh collapsed, leaving 1,100 people dead and 2,500 others injured. Stateside, a different set of issues emerged. Without these large employers in town, communities slowly crumbled as the shoemakers moved away in search of a new beginning. However, a decade after production left the area, a new life was being born just 10 miles down the road. A jiu-jitsu practitioner and young entrepreneur, he had just lost his first business in the Great Recession and was looking for a fresh start. So what I'm about to show you guys, I can't tell you how excited I am. You know, I remember listening to my, my grandfather, my papu, talk about being a young kid, first generation American from Greece, working in the Peabody tanneries, pulling tacks out of the hides by hand. And he romanticized about these things. I watched it all fall apart, get dismantled, and get exported. I can't tell you how excited I am about this, what I'm about to show you, uh, because it's something that's been needed. Shoe industry is so labor intensive, but there are a lot of other industries that can easily come back here. Can we make it again in America? Do we still have the knowledge and the skills in Maine? Can we find the machinery? Hopefully we haven't lost all of that talent, you know. Um, there's still people around who know how to do it, I hope. But it's been a while. I, I didn't know ultimately if it was possible, but I was willing to put everything I had into it, at least to prove that it wasn't possible. A former jiu-jitsu champion himself, it was during his years of competing and wearing the sports apparel that opened his eyes to the need, he says, to modernize the age-old gi. Well, I was opposed to it because that's what I am, is oppositional. So I'm like, no, we're not going to do this, and we can't do this, and what the hell are you thinking kind of thing. Well, I was helping him right from day one. I don't really think I doubted him enough to think he would not succeed. I just thought it was a crazy idea. I trusted him a little. Not enough to invest, but <laughs> I trusted him. That's not going to happen. It's impossible. It's gone. It's gone forever. It's never coming back. Well, I don't know if it could bring it back to the level it was, but it, it, I think it would be big for this area again. I would want those jobs back if it could be done in a way that people could make a decent living like we made a decent living. Having no knowledge of how it should be done, I kind of just asked a lot of questions, did a lot of research to learn how to sew. I sew everything myself because uh, I need to make sure it's perfect. That's how Origin started, was with a gi. As long as we could keep our home, the lights on, the family fed, I was good. And that first week, we finished the week, and I called the deco, and I said, we made five pairs of pants this week. I was like, what did I get myself into? So I had a lot of late nights by myself in my basement with a glass of whiskey. You know, like, what, what am I doing? And in a conversation with my father-in-law, I was like, Joe, man, I need to talk to somebody who's like been there and done that and like built something from nothing. And he's like, Pete, he's like, I've got a friend. And so we made a phone call to this guy, John. I'll leave his last name out. John said, hey, Pete. You're not special. Your ideas aren't special. And nobody gives a shit. Then he told me, you're not all in. You don't really want to win at this. I was like, no, I do. Then go all in. The next day I was at the bank signing my home away with my wife by my side for a $200,000 loan. I first want to uh, welcome everybody for coming to our grand opening of Origin USA. Yeah. I was blessed and had the honor 
to serve in the United States military during a time of war. It is a simple fact that many of the most critical victories in America's history were won not only on distant, bloody battlefields, but were also won right here, at home, in factories, in fields, and on farms. And I want to thank all of you, all of you here today, especially the workers that are going to make this happen. Thank you all for being a part of it as well. Thank you. Glad to have you as part of it. <laughs> and things were flowing really good, you know, we had the workforce and everything, then he starts talking boots. I'm going, are you crazy? You know, like, and they're all leaving for a reason. <laughs> I was sketch on boots. You know, focus on what we're doing here instead of, you know, getting that distraction I thought it was going to be. If you make boots, you got to make size 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And by the way, we're identifying where we want to grow. What's going to have the biggest impact on the community, but also what the community can handle. There's probably 80% of the employed people here worked in a shoe shop or a paper mill, so. How are we going to make shoes? And you said, we got the people. And then I remember growing up, of course, who was up here? All these massive shoe manufacturers were up here. In Maine, they made boots, they made bass, they made, they made all these things, bass boots, bass shoes. Bass shoe, Dexter shoe, mm -hmm. Hayden shoe. The knowledge is here, the people are here. It just needs a re-injection of some energy. We don't have any machinery. We don't have the workflow. We don't have the raw materials. We don't have the patterns. We, we have, don't have the we have dyes. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. As far as like the different shoe designs, I don't know. I don't know what you want to start with. These are just all. I hired you know. one person, Henry, and he'd been in the industry for 40 years. I gave him a piece of paper with how I wanted the boot to look, and I said, "This is what we want to build." And so. I'm like, I need machinery. And I had identified a few people with those skills. And I was never fearful of calling people or stopping at random mills and random places. And this one guy, Roland, he had to get rid of some machinery. And finally, I'm just like, I'm coming there right now. Hi, is Roland in? It's Pete from Origin. <laughs> we did some kind of negotiating. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do, you, what do you want, you know? You know what we ended up negotiating? He's like, can you do a lobster bake for my staff? And I said, yeah, he goes, take it all. In my early years, the old time shoemakers we used to call shoe dogs. And as I aged, I adopted the name Skip Shoe Dog. How old is Skip? 80s? Still in the game. And he goes, oh, there's plenty of people like me. And there isn't, you know, they're gone. They're dying off, they're in the 80s and 90s years old and they're, you know, they can't do this anymore. You, if we were gonna like try to figure it out and not have the knowledge, that would be one thing. We could put a little heat on this to activate the adhesive. But the knowledge has only been, it's only been removed for 20 years, right? If it had been removed for 50 years. Just activate the toe, so the bond to here. Oh. So they went through the process of the growth, and then they, they also saw it all be stripped away. And it was a chain reaction, one after the other, until here we are. It's not like the other day, so very difficult starting a production factory. I mean, it was a crapshoot. Find one or two people. And then all these young folks that we brought in, that Pete brought in, you know, we were lucky we found some, you know, 20 year olds that were interested in it and they stuck right beside them like glue and they started making boots. I grew up in this area, you know, I've lived here my whole life. Both my grandparents worked in the footwear industry. Um, my father worked in the footwear industry. All at some point in their career. So I'm gonna put 525 on this slip. That's just the last they're gonna use. When we first started, it was a lot quieter in the building. We only had a few machines and a few employees. Late 2019, we had decided just to buy this 
facility, which was a Coca-Cola plant. We had made boots. Yeah. We knew we could do it. Yeah. We had the skills. We had the technology. Yeah. Like maybe on a good day, we'd hit 10 pairs of boots a day. That was a good day. And now we're doing that in like an hour and a half. We're getting 10 pairs of boots out. So it's crazy to see the growth. I think people are so anxious now to see products made in the U.S. again. It gives me a sense of, oh, we can still do it. It's just cool to kind of carry the baton, you know? Do you know how long it's been since we've smelled lettuce? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. Kind of like a kid in a candy shop. I just want to see what it's like today. We miss the smell of leather. <laughs> wow, wow. So you watch? Can we touch? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> There's so few people in this country that have knowledge of footwear. It, it really just shows you what a dying art it is. My first day we made eight pairs of boots. And today we did what? 90? Right. Nice. I think there's already that, that slow resurgence happening. Um, yeah, all the machinery actually runs pretty good. It's just us trying to figure out how to make it work right. It's been the it's big terrible. thing. Grandparents are parents who lost their jobs, now seeing their kids talking about this, like manufacturing and making products. That's a, a cool skill to have. People need jobs and they need a purpose in life. And even while Origin was growing, like factories were still leaving the area. It's cool to be part of a movement to bring that back. There is life after mass, yeah. and there has been. Yeah. For all of us. We had such a rich history in footwear, and it's cool to just capture that last bit of knowledge and kind of keep it going.